Take your Bible, turn to John 17, and um, I'm going to drop back just for a second. Uh, it's good to have everybody here tonight, and uh, we've enjoyed uh, Brother Ernie and Sister Netta's company this last couple days, and um, just good to fellowship with men. It's good to fellowship with uh, other preachers and just hear from them and, and just talk to one another. And um, preachers make friends out of preachers uh, because really they're the only ones that know what all we go through and what all, what all challenges we face and the victories that we get and so on. And um, I always just like to tell all my preacher friends, hey, one of these days we'll get our reward. Amen. We'll get it. And I'd rather, I'd rather God hold on to it till I get there. Because if I had it now, I'd squander it or break it, one way or the other. John 17, this is um, Christ's prayer to, um, for his disciples, for all of those who follow him. We call it the priestly prayer, um, call it uh, Christ's prayer for his church, the body, and so on. And um, I wanted to, let's see here, where am I going tonight? Uh, okay, I, w I wanted to back up just for a, s a little bit because there was something that I didn't cover last Wednesday night, and um, and I do want to touch on it, and I want to kind of get, I want to get your, I want to put you on the hot seat tonight, and I want to call you on the carpet over something, okay? Just, just bear with me, okay? Uh, but give me your honest opinion. But let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask Him to bless our study of His Word tonight. Uh, we can study this book and study this same chapter until the Lord comes home. We'll never, number one, get all the things out of it that are in there. Number two, we won't understand every single thing that's in here. But God, thank you for sending us your Holy Spirit. We'll believe everything that God said in here. Amen. Including not to call a man Holy Father. That's on my agenda for tonight. Father, we love you and we thank you for... Blessing us the way you have. We thank you, God, for giving us a beautiful day. And, Lord, for all the things that you have allowed to come our way. Lord, we worship you and we thank you tonight. And thank you, Lord, for picking out that song. Lord, you've come to us softly and tenderly. And you just very patiently, you knock. And you're patient with us. And, God, you've waited for some of us, Lord, you didn't have to wait long. For others, you waited quite a while, but Lord, it was worth it. And Father, we thank you for being very kind to us and tender-hearted and compassionate and full of mercy. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would give us such a ministry is that we could not only show mercy to other people, but Father, Lord, that we could teach and share the mercy that God has given us. Lord, that we would not be too proud with our lost friends and lost family members to admit when we've made mistakes and, and use that, Father, to let them know that we're not calling people to be perfect. We're calling people to be forgiven. And God, you'll bring the perfection. Father, we ask you, bless your word tonight. Open up our eyes. Lord, you know that I don't want to teach or preach anything that is in direct opposition to your word. So, Father, Lord, just guide us tonight as we study these things, especially, Lord, about Saul and what happened with him. Lord, just open us up tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, let's, let's start reading in, uh, let's see, John 17, verse 4. And let's see, we're going to go to verse 10 on this. Um, starting in verse four, Jesus said, I've glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory, which I had with thee before the world was folks. We're not, we can't see into the past. We can't really see into the future, but I promise you, if Jesus prayed this and he asked God to share with him the glory that they both had before the world was, 
when you and I are standing in the presence of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, you and I are going to be witnesses of the glory that Jesus shared with His Father before there was eyes to see it. Somebody say, Amen. Man, I can't, that's going to be awesome. And right now in our flesh bodies, we can't handle it. We would just, we would melt like wax before the presence of the Lord. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou, and what is his name? I just, we just talked about this. What is his name? Well, keep going. Lord. That's the most one. That's the one you'll find the most in the Bible. The Lord. And you get all these Hebrew roots people saying, well, that's a title. That's not a name. Well, Father's a title too, but it's his name. I never called my daddy, hey, Milton. Milton Don. Never did that. I never said, hey, Julia Ann. That's my mom's real name, Julia. Hey, Julia! Never did that. It was mom and dad. But he manifested his name, the Lord. And we have other names of him in the Bible, but the Lord is the most prominent one. Uh, let's see here. Verse 6 again. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now that's what I'm going to... I got one more thing to say on that. They have kept thy word. Verse 7, now they have known that all things whatsoever, there's our favorite phrase again, and I'm going to talk about that too. All things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words. Listen to that now, the words. And in the day when every church nearly is denying the power of the written word of God, denying it, now, we have a big problem with that up here in Missouri. I'm pretty sure down in Arkansas, all the churches down there are still preaching the old word of God. Old, right? Nope, not even close. Um, and you know what? He's a nice guy. He is. He's a nice guy. His wife, nice people. Just very, just kind, courteous, nice people. He's got enemies. That hate his guts down there. For what reason? The Bible. Um, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now, that phrase there, that I came out from thee. Let me just stop for a minute, and I'll share with you what I know about this. Jesus is given, hey, you guys now in the back row, if you're going to sit back there, you're going to pay attention, okay? Right? Say, yes, preacher. Say, amen, preacher. All right. Say, candy after church, preacher. Now, now they're opening up. But you gotta be, you gotta behave back there. That's my grandson. Listen to him. Can I have candy, preacher? Uh, you'll be lucky to have oxygen in less than an hour, son. Um, what was I going to say now? I lost much. Oh, notice in verse eight, he says. Uh, they have received them. He said, I gave the words and they've received them and that I came out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. Turn very quickly to Psalm chapter uh, Deuce, I believe. Chapter 2. Yeah. Now, there's a, there's a phrase attributed to Christ that is not attributed to any other of God's um, creation, God's kingdom, God's people. We are declared to be sons of God. 
but there is a difference between us and Christ. And it's a difference. It's one of those things that I believe, but I can't tell you that I understand it. Notice that he says in verse of Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. We know that in John 3, 16, in the King James, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his which son? His only begotten son. The newer translations all say one and only son, which is a lie. That's not true because you have the sons of God mentioned in the Old Testament. You have the sons of God in the New Testament are exclusively the church, the body of Christ. We are the sons of God in the New Testament. But we are, we are, it is not attributed to us that we are the only begotten son of God. Now, the reason why I bring that up is here in verse 8 of John 17, he says, um, had, And have known surely that I came out from thee, and they believed that thou didst send me. Now, we know what the word begotten means. Okay? It, it literally means fathered into this world. Okay? Cain was begotten of Adam and Eve. And if you read Genesis 5, you'll see that Adam lived such and such years and he begat Seth. So we know that in, in that situation, we understand uh, as humans, as adults, what that means, that he is begotten of his father, Adam. Uh, and there's always going to be a controversy in some people's minds about, did Christ have a beginning? And um, I don't believe for a second that Christ ever had a beginning. He is the same as God. He always was from everlasting past. He is right now. That's what the phrase, I am that I am, I think represents. It's, it's right now, I am. And then he, he always shall be. He is the first and he is the last. He's the first begotten of the, of the dead, the Bible says. And so on. But what does it mean? When the Bible says those things, Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. Um, what, what does that denote? Uh, and here Jesus adds to uh, what, it, to my mind, is a mystery. Uh, in verse 8 here, I've, I've read it several times now, and have known surely that I came out from thee. Okay? Now, I'm just telling you, I don't understand that. And if you have a really good answer, I'd like to hear it sometime. But I just don't, I don't understand it. Rule number one in my mind is Jesus does not have a beginning. And he doesn't have an end. Okay? But rule number two is, thou art, uh, this is my son, this day, thou, uh, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, I don't, again, I, and here again he says, I came out from thee. We know earlier in John, I think it's in John chapter 1, where Jesus said that he came from the bosom of the Father. Okay? And I'm not trying to uh, sow any, uh, yeah, in John chapter 1, verse 18, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, there it is, uh, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And uh, again, I, I just, my mind can't wrap around that idea, but I believe it. And I don't believe we ought to change the Bible simply because there's something we don't understand. In fact, that's, to me, that's the thrill of it, David, is when I see something in the Bible I don't understand, I get aggravated at God and say, God, you need to tell me this now. I got a Pastor Mike online coming up tomorrow and I, I got something to talk about. And I think you ought to tell me what this means. I want to know. And I want to know now. But he doesn't always tell me now. So I'll just have to wait like everybody else does, I guess. One of these days I will know, even as I am known. Amen? All right, now, that's, that's hard question number one. Hard question number two. Uh, let's... Uh, 
remember last Wednesday night, we were focusing on the fact that Jesus gave his disciples the word and they kept his word. He said, they have, thy word have they kept. That means they held on to it. They didn't walk away from it as a, as a person, as a human being. You've decided this is it right here. I'm not going to read this plus uh, seven habits of highly effective people. I'm not going to uh, uh, read this plus the Book of Mormon. I'm not going to read this plus the, the Catechism. I'm not going to read this plus uh, anything written by, um, oh, let's see, Chuck Smith or uh, who are some of these other authors? John MacArthur or anything. I'm not going to read that junk. I'm just going to read and believe what the Word of God says. I'm going to keep it. This is it right here. If God said it, this is the way it is. And I've, I've settled it in my mind. This is, how I'm, this is my life. This is how I'm going to be. Okay? So, we looked at people in the Bible where they kept His Word. They kept it all the way to the end. But we have Saul here. And if we go to, uh, let's, let me read this verse up on the screen. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord. Now, here's, here's my question, or maybe the topic for this moment. God told David, he said, uh, the son that shall cut, you know, David says, you know, Lord, I want to build your house. God said, you can't build my house. You got blood on your hands. So he said, the son that comes from thy bowels, he shall build a house unto me. He shall be my son. I will be his father. And if he commit any transgression, I will chasten him with the rod and the stripes of men. But my mercy will I not take from him as I took it from Saul. So we clearly see that God had everlasting favor on Solomon. But God didn't have everlasting mercy and favor on Saul. And what is curious to me, and always has been, ever since I first searched this out, was that we, and we've got a long list, it's called the book of Ecclesiastes, of the things that Solomon messed up in his life. All the women, all the temples that he built to false gods, the incense that he burnt to all these different gods that his wives told him, Oh, honey, I want to worship my God. Will you let me worship my God? Build me a temple. You built uh, Abishag over here a temple. Won't you build me a temple? So he built some nasty temple for one of his wives, one of his 700 wicked wives that he's got because he married strange women. And he sinned greatly in those things. But he's in heaven. And how do we know? Holy men of God spake because they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we have Solomon in heaven, and we have a whole list of things that Solomon did wrong. We have Saul in hell, and we've only got one thing that the Bible says he did. My question is, and I, I am leaning in this direction, I think what Saul did was commit the unpardonable sin. So let's look that up here. Uh, if you do a study on Saul, I would encourage you to do it. Because what you're going to get is you're going to get a man who, when he is called to be the king, immediately you see that he's, a, he's anointed. The Holy Ghost has fallen upon him. He is, he begins to prophesy. And there's a saying that went out through all the land. Is Saul among the prophets of Israel? In other words, he was preaching everywhere he went. He was preaching the word of God everywhere he went. So you've got a preacher king to be the first king anointed by God to be king over Israel. A man that, according to the word of God, had the Holy Spirit on him. Okay? But... That's not how things ended up. Um, let's see here. Where am I going? Um, I think 1 Samuel. No, it's not 1 Samuel 13. 
Where is it? Um, somebody help me out here. Huh? Yeah, First Samuel 16. Turn there. We, we might just hit it here in a minute. Is, is where Saul lost it. 1 Samuel, what chapter? 16. Uh, I didn't prepare for this, obviously. This just kind of came to my mind uh, right as I was walking down to this pulpit. Um, Saul was given... Um, actually, it's in chapter 15. Chapter 15 here. Uh, let's go back there because you're going to see Saul lie. Saul was given a list of things to do by Samuel. And understand that Samuel is the word of the Lord. He's the Bible. God gave Samuel. He told Samuel, tell Saul this. Samuel was faithful and he told Saul what to do. Saul then was under the obligation to do not, not because it was Samuel that said it, but because it was God said it through Samuel. But you still, Samuel represents the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is to be, you got, if God says do it, you, get, you do it. Okay? And so, um, the, one of the things that he was supposed to do was when they went in, they was to kill everybody. Kill all the sheep, kill all the cattle, kill everything, kill the king. Because this was God enforcing basically a police action, a judgment uh, upon these people, the Amalekites. Uh, but if you look in verse 15, the Bible says, And Saul said, they have, brought them, uh, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the, the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? We're going to sacrifice to God. But what are they sacrificing? They're sacrificing things that didn't even belong to them to begin with. That's like that, uh, that brother that came and told us about what they do in India. Those rich Indian heathens will go and kidnap children from the, from the slums, take them to some place way out in the middle of the jungle somewhere, to some temple, and have those children sacrificed for their personal sins. And I'm going, that's just wicked. You're not paying anything for your sins. You're making somebody else pay the price for your sins. And not even Christ at that. It's just, it's just murder. They're, those people, oh, I'll tell you what, they got a lot to answer for. But anyway, so they're, here they are sacrificing these things, and they didn't even own them. They were supposed to kill them all, but they're going to look all holy. You know how people are. They're going to look holy. They're going to look spiritual. They're going to sit in a church pew and they're going to say amen and they're going to give tithes and offerings and they're going to be on the board or they're going to be in the deacons. They're going to be in this Sunday school or that, that trustee or whatever. They're going to be prominent in the church and be the, uh, uh, have, have substance in the church and have their way in the church, but they're not right with God. Not right with God. They act like everything's good, but it's not. They brought them from the Malachites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, sacrificed them to the Lord their God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And so, verse 17, And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. So verse 19 is the question. Wherefore, which means why, why then, wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? You see, the Bible knows that you didn't do right. The Bible, what is it that... The, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's able to discern and understand the, the nature of men. Jesus, all the time, the Bible says he discerned their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. He knew the wickedness that was in. So when they asked questions, he knew that they were trying to set him up. How did he know that? He's the word of God. And so he was told specifically to do this. He didn't do it. And um, he was supposed to destroy them, but he didn't do it. And Samuel said in verse 22, Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, 
and to hearken than the fat of rams for rebellion. Here it is. It says the sin of witchcraft. There's a prophecy here. Now, take this. Think about this. Twofold. I may not even get into the rest of my notes tonight. But think about this. It's a twofold prophecy. Number one, it's going to happen to Saul. Saul ends up into witchcraft, dies the next day. Be and it, it happened exactly the way Samuel said it was going to happen. Uh, your rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. It's also a prophecy. Pastor, you deal with this. I deal with this. You see it. I see it. Whenever a church replaces the word of God, which is the gospel of our salvation. Peter made that very clear. It's the word. It's the seed. It's the incorruptible seed of the word of God. This is how we're born again. When a church, a congregation, a ministry, a study group or whatever, when they will not conform and abide by the words of this book, this Bible, I promise you they're headed toward a form of witchcraft. I promise you. Because witchcraft is defined basically as a religion that requires the utterance of certain words, the repetition of those words, using enchantments, um, the physical functions of the body, uh, facing in certain directions, doing it on certain high, what they call high holy days, sabbats or shabbats that they call them, which is Sabbaths. Um, summer solstice is one of them. Let's see, that'll be coming up. What's the day? The 14th and seven more days will be the summer solstice. And so I promise you, if you, if you're going to be, if you can look online on, on, uh, June 21st, you will see witches and pagans gathered around Stonehenge because on Stonehenge, the light first thing in the morning comes in at a certain spot. Stonehenge was built to abide by the solstices and the equinoxes. The sun comes in at a certain spot and shines on a certain spot there at Stonehenge. And there's other places like that all around the world where the ancient, whoever they, probably the giants more than anything, they built these things to uh, abide by and go along the solstices and the equinoxes. Why? Because they believed that their God or God himself could be, uh, could be acquired on that day or you, he, he could be heard on that day or you have a better chance of having your prayers answered on that day or any kind of nonsense like that. It, just any kind of garbage. But it's all about a works-based blessing. If I do these things and I say these words and I'm facing in these directions and I do it on this certain day, then the universe will respond in my favor and will grant me my petitions or God will do this for me. I, I have a, I don't have the video anymore. Wouldn't know where to find it. Uh, if somebody finds it, send it to me. But of Beth Moore doing this, uh, number one, she shouldn't have been doing anything up on the stage behind the pulpit in that church. Number two, she had everybody, she had, she divided the church up in four. She said, you people face east, you people face west, you face south and you face north. And we're all, all of us are going to call on the Lord from the north to the south. And that's witchcraft. What way do we have to be turned to call upon God? Laying down, leaning, propped up, it doesn't matter. Amen. Call on the name of the Lord. Thou shalt be saved. So basically, I don't know where she got the idea. I don't know if somebody told her this. I don't know if she saw it somewhere and thought it was a good idea, or read it in a book. You have, uh, who was that? The, the circle maker, Mark Batterson. He was the pastor of the National Cathedral there in Washington, D.C., where the presidents go to church and pretend they're spiritual. And uh, he wrote a book called Honey the Circle Maker. And he got it from Jewish traditions, Jewish fables. That's what he got it from. 
that a man named Honey wanted God to listen to him, so he drew a circle and stood in the middle of that circle and he stood there like this and he said, God, I'm not going to move out of this circle until you bless me and bless Israel and until you make it rain and all this stuff. He didn't know that he never had to draw the circle to begin with. He didn't know that he had to just stand there inside some place and be bullheaded and stubborn. He didn't know that he could just repent and, and call upon the name of the Lord or just cry out to God, God, I don't want my family to starve to death. God, will you feed? Listen, God feeds even those that don't repent. Good grief. Anyway, so that's witchcraft. What, what's, what's happening is because churches have left the Word of God. Now they're going to claim they have it. Saul claimed that he didn't. He said, I did exactly what you said. And Samuel said, no, you didn't. If you did what I told you to do, why am I hearing sheep bleeding in the background? So now, he says in verse 23, Rebellion is as sin of witchcraft, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. Look at what he did. He said, oh, I'm going to repent now, for I've sinned. I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, I will not return with thee. Saul, did you, did you not just hear me? I said, I'm rejecting you. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. God refused. God refused to forgive or pardon Saul for this one sin. I want to say teeny tiny little sin. No, but it, no, that's the big deal right there. Now, um, let's see here. Yeah. Evil spirit. That's what I'm looking for. The Bible says, 1 Samuel 16, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So now, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit to guide him, the Spirit of the Lord. Here's the Spirit of the Lord. It's in this book. It's everything this book is. This book is inspired. It, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It is the spirit of the Lord right here. It is, it is the substance of God. It is everything that God is, is, is contained in this one book. And we believe it. But what God did was exactly what he promised David he would do. Is that he would not have mercy. Let's see, let me find that verse. And, I, and if you turn to Psalm 89 while I'm doing this. I'll show you a second witness of it. Um, my mercy. Yeah. Second Samuel 7. Here's what God said to David about his son. In verse 13, uh, he shall build a house of my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever and I will be his father and he shall be my son. Now there's a there's a partial fulfillment and a complete fulfillment of this. The partial fulfillment is in Solomon. The complete, perfect fulfillment is in Christ. Christ is the Son of God. God is His Father. Christ is His Son. In the, in the imperfect uh, completion of this, Solomon becomes God's Son. He's in the place of Christ. And... God says here, I will be his father and he shall be my son if he commit iniquity. I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. In Solomon's case, he did commit iniquity and God chastened him. In Christ's case, Christ never did, so there was never any need for chastening. In fact, Christ took our chastening. Okay? Uh, but he said, verse 15, My mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul. So what you have here... You've got, you've got people that are on this side that say, oh, it's once prayed, always saved. You prayed when you were eight years old, and so you're always going to be saved until the day you die. It doesn't matter what you do, no matter how you live. 
You just may not get the rewards that I'm going to get when I'm in heaven with you. But you're always saved no matter what you do. And, and that can, you can never lose that and be, never be taken away. And then you've got some over here. Finnis Dake teaches this. And this is what uh, causes a lot of controversy and a lot of strife in people's lives. Is that they believe that God takes their salvation away every time they sin. Every time you sin, you lose your salvation. You're going to hell right then. And, and this was actually preached from my pulpit. And uh, I didn't deal with it very well, I dealt with it the right way, I'll say that. But that's called repeated regeneration, where you're, you're barely hanging on to a very thin strand of salvation and mercy from God. And the least little bit of sin will sever that, and you must be saved all over again. You ever run anybody that, that believes that way? Or, yeah, they're out there. Okay? But here it is, right here. We have a man. That by God's election, God has said, I will never, ever take my mercy away from Solomon, ever. And all those sins that he committed, God beat the fire out of him. He writes the book of Ecclesiastes to tell everybody, I had everything that every man could ever want. And I'm telling you guys, it's not worth it. You don't, it it'll, it'll cost you more than anything. You'll be troubled all the days of your life. And when you die, you have nothing. Can't take any of it with you into eternity. It's, it's, it's nothing. It's waste. It's vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And then you have Saul, who right now is saying, ah! Why? He's in hell. Okay? And his testimony would be, don't reject the word of the Lord. So, when it comes to this idea of what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's see here. I'll leave it like that. 59 times. Matthew 12. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Wow, listen to that. How many of you all ever took God's name in vain? Come on now. Your mama said, try this bar of dial soap. It's good for that. Oh, I hated that. That was awful. My mom did that to me. She's teaching me a lesson though. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever shall speak of the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh, see, because people say Jesus Christ all the time. In, in fact, I, I just kind of take a note. People send a note to me every now and then and say, Pastor, have you seen this such and such movie? You need to watch this. It's got this in it. So I'll watch it a little while. And I mean, almost invariably in every movie, there's someone saying, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And I'm going, hey, man, boy, preach it. No, I'm not doing that. I have noted that in American films, especially of this time that we're in now, the blaspheming of the name of Jesus Christ is almost in every film. It's almost like they're making a statement. Well, it is. They're making a statement. They're blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ. You never have anybody in any movie saying, well, holy Buddha. They don't say it. Okay? They're blaspheming Christ. But here he said, Whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So, what do you think, Pastor? I told you I was going to call you out on it, so I hope you were listening. My theory is blaspheming against the Holy Ghost. Speaking blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is what Saul did when he rejected the word of the Lord. It's, it's, it's really what I, what I it, to me it sticks out as a, a God drawing a picture of what this doctrine looks like. 
What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Take a look at Saul. Look at what Saul did. See what Saul did? Just for one little sin, I made a promise that I would never, ever, 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 ever forgive Saul ever again for any of his sin. And he didn't. And Saul tried to, he tried to repent. And Samuel said, you didn't get it. What do you think? Yeah, you agree with it? And 25 cents. Anyway. Yeah. That's good. I never noticed that. always saved now Saul went to heaven he just not he believe it or not there's actually a teaching where they say that there is a place that they say that obviously there is a place in heaven where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and that's where this saved go who did not serve God and uh, did not follow God and where the Bible says they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're in heaven. They're just in a place where there's weeping. And I'm just going, you know what? You are desperately trying to prop up a, a doctrinal position that has absolutely no scriptural basis whatsoever. You're desperately trying to prop it up by twisting scripture. There is no place in heaven where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Cut it out. It can't be. God shall wipe all tears from their eyes. But see, that's, that's a case where they're trying to protect and defend the doctrine because the doctrine really has very little merit on itself and it constantly has to be, and I know preachers, they can't go 15 minutes without saying eternal security, lose your salvation. They can't do it. They got to keep reinforcing it in their people to get them to believe it. And, they, and it still doesn't matter. God plainly took, and I've read these articles. I know exactly what you're talking about. God took, God took the Holy Spirit away from, from Saul. Saul was rejected by God, an evil spirit came to him, and he turned to witchcraft exactly the way Samuel said it was going to happen. And I would, I would say this, and I, I don't encourage you to study witchcraft, but if you know anything about witchcraft at all, and you want to know or be able to recognize or spot a church that has rejected the word of the Lord, you would be able to find the signs and the evidences of it in that church and how they worship and the things that they do and, and what they allow and, and the things they say and so on. You will be able to recognize witchcraft when you see it or rebellion or idolatry. You'll be able to recognize it when you see it. And when you're in that place, you can say, you know what? I think God's written Ichabod on this church. I'm thinking I'm take my family out and we're going to go to Bethel Amen. or First Church Fort Smith. Amen. 
It, it is first church, right? Yeah. yeah, first church, okay? You're the first to show up, so you're the first church, all right? Uh, so anyway, that's my, that's my, uh, that's my theory. Uh, that the bottom line is Saul didn't keep it. That's, that's not what I wanted. There we go. Saul didn't keep it. He died for the transgression which he committed. By the way, there's another verse that when, when people argue with me and say, well, that, was, that really was Samuel that came up out of there to talk to Saul. No, it wasn't. It was a familiar spirit because God later on said, so Saul died for his, uh, yeah, here it is right here, I'm looking at it. And for also asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. It was a devil that he was talking to. It was, it, it, it is exactly what's happening now. The, the familiar spirit that Saul saw when he had his Sawzall, when Saul saw this familiar spirit, you're looking at a type of what is going to happen because a man is going to rise up and people will think that is the word of the Lord. That's Jesus. It must be. Um, I remember reading years ago that Muslims believe that Jesus was going to return and that he was going to prove to the world that all the world should turn to Islam. And I had envisioned in my mind Jesus um, and, and this great imam of, of Islam coming down from heaven and declaring to the world that everyone should have been worshiping Allah all this time and his prophet Muhammad. But then I found out that they don't believe that he's coming down from heaven. They believe he's coming up out of a well. And I went, oh, I know who that is. That's the Antichrist, the beast. I get it. He has a worship in the devil. How cute. So you'll spot witchcraft when you see a church that has rejected the word of the Lord. I promise you, this Bible is telling you that they will worship, they will practice witchcraft. In one form or another, they'll be doing it. Okay, they'll be doing it. 